Uh, praise the Lord, for he is indeed worthy to be praised. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the prayers that have been prayed, the songs that have been sung, and for those who will lead us throughout the remainder of the service after the message. This world is indeed not our home. We are just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We don't have to know exactly where they are, because we know who laid on there, don't we? Amen. Our Lord Jesus said that he went to prepare a place for us in yeah. John 14, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And so if Jesus went to prepare something for us, we know two things. We know that he, we know that he knows where it is, mm -hmm. and we know that it's in a good place wherever it is. Yeah. Amen. 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 Y'all doing all right today? Yes. Amen. Let's return to Acts 19. Acts 19, continuing our study of verses 11 through 20, uh, displacing uh, devilish influence in Acts 19. Acts 19. And I'm reading from the New King James. Acts 19, verses 11 through 20. Listen to what the Bible says. You have to say amen. amen. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit uh, by the, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now you know when people are scared, huh? Because they run to Jesus, don't they? Any other time they do their own thing, church is the last thing on their mind, serving God is not even on their list. But boy, when they get scary, they bypass mama and run straight to the Lord, huh? Also, and excuse me, verse 18, and many who had believed came, confessing and telling their deeds. And many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Look at verse 20. So the word of the Lord grew mightily mm -hmm. and prevailed. So last week we did, uh, we pointed out how, how Paul was different from the Jews who were pretending uh, who were pretending to be uh, to be followers of Christ. We talked about how because Paul embraced who he was as a as a person of God, as a man of God, he was able to do a lot of good things that healed people's bodies and also drove the demons away from them. And so, as we read further that further on, we saw this group of, as the Bible describes them, itinerant Jews, or depending on the translation you have, vagabond Jews who say, "Hey." Demon, leave this person uh, in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches. The demon said, hold on, I know Paul. <laughs> I know Christ, but I don't know you. And that man who he possessed, that demon led him to just get out of control. There was so much chaos in the house. The Bible says that the people ran out of that house naked and wounded because he just wrecked havoc on them. Now, you know they had to be scared if they ran out of the house with no clothes on, right? <laughs> all right, all right. I'm not trying to implicate nobody. I'm just talking about what the Bible says here. Now, uh, just, you know, let's, 
we, 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 we stand with the paid man, stand with the book. Yeah, all right. Yeah, well, oh, but you don't see what I see, Brother Terry. <laughs> Maybe you ought to come sit up here someday. <laughs> so, so when that event happened, the word spread. You know, people are like, oh, man, Jesus is the real deal. You know, if this demon knew who he was, and responded that way then we better get right or else we gonna have to deal with this demon all by ourselves mm. so much so that the ones who practice uh, magic who practice witchcraft uh you know we call it a little something different today we might call it hoodoo or voodoo or you know whatever else it is let people shake their hands because we know hey man somebody look look just because you know it exists doesn't mean you practice it y'all exactly. yes <laughs> but it is biblical that it did exist and and we'll look at that at another time. Burn the books. And the Bible says that the word of the Lord prevailed. Isn't that a beautiful thing in verse 20? How the word of the Lord prevailed. Amen. So the first thing we see when it comes to being a pretender is that exposure is sometimes painful. In this case, they dealt with physical and they dealt with mental pain, physical because they were wounded, mental because it was shameful and still is shameful to, 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 to be completely exposed, mm. to be completely undressed in a public setting. And I'm talking about people who have good sense. Now, if they have some mental things going on, you know, they, you know, they operate, they're operating in a different, in a different realm altogether. But there was some shame that took place once these pretenders were exposed. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, if we don't leave with anything else today, let us leave here knowing that if we choose to be a pretender, yeah. one day we will be exposed. Mm. And we will be exposed at the most inconvenient and most inopportune time. And guess what, church? It's not a good feeling. <laughs> Okay, okay, let me, let, me, let me come a little closer to you. We know about pretenders, don't we? We ever dealt with people who pretended to have more money than they actually did. All they did was brag about what they had, what they had, but when you were in a financial strait and you needed to borrow something, they were always broke. Pretenders. Do we know people who brag, who always brag about knowing people who were really important and had a whole lot of clout and a whole lot of influence? And you cross paths with that person and say, do you know so-and-so? No, I never heard of him, never met him in day. Well, even if you pull up their picture on Facebook and say, well, does the face ring a, you know, does the face ring a bell? No. Mm -hmm. Pretenders. Uh, or what about people every time you talk about something that you've done? You may say, hey, you know, I, I went uh, to, you know, I went, you know, maybe on a cruise for a few days. And they'll come back and say, well, I went on a cruise for a few weeks. Or you may say you went to a uh, vacation somewhere, you know, somewhere like, you know, not too far away, far away like San Antonio. And they come back and say, well, I went on a vacation to, uh, to all of the islands in the Caribbean. You, you get the point. Every time you have something to say, they pretend that they've done something greater than you did. And we all know the truth because we know them. Amen, somebody. Pretenders. But my church family, they keep on pretending. One day pretenders will be exposed. Kind of remind me of that old saying. Uh, I don't remember exactly what song that is from. Some of you may know where it said, if you ain't what you is, then you is what you ain't. Pretenders. You know, I ran across a pretender one time. Uh, you know, this, this guy came by, by my job, and he was selling candles and potpourri and things like that. And, I, you know, we started talking. He said, yes, you know, I'm a, I'm a war veteran trying to make it. I just got back from Afghanistan. And at that time, I, uh, I knew people who were serving in Afghanistan and knew people who had gotten back and, you know, knew people who were in the military. So, you know, you strike up a conversation, you talk to him. Well, what did you do when you were over there? He had his talk track straight. And so then we'd ask the conversation progress, asking, well, you know, when you, when you, you know, when you left, what, what, you know, what rank were you when you got out? Oh, this is when it got interesting. He said, well, you know, I was a colonel when I got out. Oh, okay, you were a colonel when you got out. So where'd you go to school at? Oh, I went to Princeton. Oh, so you went to Princeton and you were a colonel when you got out. And I didn't say this to him, but you're selling potpourri and candles. All right, okay. 
But the guy looked to be about my age, and at that time, I was in my early 30s. Y'all know this really getting interesting, right? So I, so I said, so asked him, I said, well, how old are you, man? And by that time, he knew that he had gone at the end of his rope. So he just politely stood still for about 30 seconds and couldn't, out think, couldn't come up with an answer fast enough, so he just politely walked away. Yeah. Why? Because as a pretender, he had been exposed. Mm -hmm. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, one thing that we will see is that when a person is exposed, when we are exposed, it hurts. Our pride is hurt. However, the irony is, in order to protect our pride, instead of just turning that fake stuff loose, we hold on to it and try to ride it on out. Mm -hmm. Don't we know we save ourselves a lot of pain as soon as we just repent and let it go and embrace who we are? Don't we know that we can just get on with our lives a lot easier and a lot faster if we just accept things as they are instead of pretending? Mm -hmm. The word that we used last week when we talked about pretenders was, was hypocrite, right? How a Christian would pretend, how you know, when a Christian pretends to be someone that they are not. Mm -hmm. They are following the model of these uh, vagabond Jews or these itinerant Jews because they were pretending to be something that they were not. Mm -hmm. And so my church family, we see that this demon-possessed man, he wounded them, he hurt them, and they ran out of the house, and their shame was known publicly. And here's the question that I have, though. You know, it's often been said, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but we can't fool all the people all the time. But I want to go a step further with that. We cannot fool God any time. And then, even though we may forget about it, we cannot fool the devil anytime. He's the master of deception. That's who he is. That's how he operates. Let me give it. Let me get a little closer to you. You ever notice? Some, you ever notice when you're dealing with uh, a senior citizen, they can ask you about three questions and have a summary of your whole life and your character. Well, the devil's been around longer than a senior citizens have. The devil is a supernatural being, which means that they have an ability that the natural man or the natural woman does not. And so brothers and sisters, while we're out here pretending, while we're out here allowing the devil to influence us to deceive people, just be mindful that we're going up against something that's greater than us and we will lose in the end. Amen, Let me give you some examples of people who dibbled and dabbled with the devil and end up losing. Uh, this, we can go all the way to our first family in the Garden of Eden. The devil came to them. He pretended to be on their side. He came to them and said, you know, I, I care about you more than God does. You know, he's holding something back from you, but but I want to give you something that he hasn't given you before. And then in a then in a matter of time, Adam and Eve, they fell for that lie, that deceptive lie, and ended up losing. And when we get to the root of the motive why we choose to pretend and why we choose to get involved in sin is because we believe that same satanic sermon that he preached to Eve in the garden. What is that satanic sermon? It's very short. It's called, You Shall Not Surely Die. Because the consequences of sin are spelled out in the Word of God. However, when we choose to live, uh, choose to live and embrace a sinful lifestyle, internally we're saying that nothing's going to happen to us. We will not surely die. But let me give you some more examples of people who got tripped up. Um, what about, uh, excuse me, what about uh, Samson? You know, Samson, his course had been charted as a Nazarite. He had a certain set of rules to follow. Yeah. However, he got linked up with someone who pretended to care about him. And in the midst of being linked up with that person who pretended to care about him, his lifestyle said, well, it's okay for me to live with this person that he was forbidden to be with because she was not of his, of his same ancestral origin. And we know how that story ended, right? She pressed him and pressed him and pressed him until finally he gave her the source of his strength. She had some people, you know, she cut his hair while he was asleep had some people come tie him up, blind him, and we know how the story ended. Mm. Or what about, uh, or what about uh, let me give you another example. 
What about David? We know about the escapade he had with Bathsheba, don't we? David, when he got out there and the woman got pregnant, he tried to cover it up, right? The cover up is an attempt to pretend that something that is real doesn't exist. That's what a cover up is. I'm not making sense this morning because some of you are sure looking at me strange. How did David try to cover it up? Well, when he found out that Bathsheba was pregnant, he said, oh, let me, let me have you right. Let me pull you right off this battlefield. Man, go home and lay with your wife. Now, that right there lets you know something is bad if you're telling me to go home and lay with my wife. That ain't none of your business in the first place, right? But that didn't work. Uriah was so loyal that he didn't do it. And then he had Uriah sent to the hottest part of battle so that he could be killed. And so as the story progressed, the, um, uh, Nathan the prophet came and spoke to David and brought David face to face with his issues. And David said that when he asked him that question about a person who had a man who had a lot of uh, lambs and took the only lamb that another person had and killed it, what should be done? David said that man should be killed. Nathan said, King David, you are the man. Shook him. He came face to face with that issue that he was trying to pretend didn't exist. But then as the story progressed, that child was born and God took that child. But here's the thing. David lost the child, but in losing that child, he felt a sense of freedom. Why is that? Because he didn't have to work to cover up what he had done anymore. Lost the child. That's painful. But David had a peace of mind because he knew that he was good with God at that point. Brothers and sisters, make the decision today to be good with God so it won't cost you more than you're ready to spend. Another thing that we know about God is when it comes to pretenders, we see that God has a track record of making sure that pretenders are exposed. Let me share something else with you, an example. And uh, please go with me, if you will, to Nahum chapter 3, verse 5. Just stay with me. I'm headed somewhere momentarily. Nahum chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. Listen to this. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. When we talk about God, we say things about him such as he's in the loving business. He's in the blessing business. But I want to let you in on something if we don't know it yet. He's also in the shaming business. And if we are pretending, if we are allowing ourselves to be misled by devilish influence so that we start to pretend to be someone who we are, not guess what? He will shame us. We also remember about some other pretenders, Ananias and Sapphira. Please turn to Acts chapter 5, verse 9 and 11. 9 through 11, excuse me. Acts chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Listen to what the Bible says. Then Peter said to her, referring to uh, Sapphira, then Peter said to her, how is it? that you have agreed together to test the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband at the door, and they will carry you out. To get a running start, they had sold some property and said that they had given all of the proceeds to, uh, to, the, to help other members of the body, but they had not given all of the proceeds. They didn't have a reason. A lot. All they had to do was give what they had given and admitted to it, but no, they wanted to pretend that they had done more than they actually had done. So the husband came in, he got caught in a lie and died. The wife came in and Peter speaks to her and says, hey, look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in, found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Pretending, the Lord exposed it. It caused some people uh, their pride. It caused David a son 
But in this instance, it cost a married couple their lives. You can make the argument and say, well, at least they were in agreement. Well, they were in agreement, but the key is, but the key is, being in agreement with each other doesn't mean anything if both of you are not in agreement with God. Amen. So when we see that, when we see how God exposes people, let's go back to our passage in Acts chapter 19, verse number 17. It became, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was what? It was magnified, right? Many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. They weren't holding anything back. Also, many who had the books, they burned the books. Now look at this. The news spread. People became afraid. Folks came and, and just said what they did out in the open. Wasn't, wasn't even worried about, you know, onlookers or what people may say about them or how they would be viewed in the eyes of others. They just wanted to get that thing right with God. And the desire to please God was so strong that they took their books and they burned them. Now, I want to make an application about this book burning. They use, in the text here, it says that they used those books to practice magic or, or witchcraft, if you will. But when we look at another thing that books were used for, books are also used to convey information. Books are a form of media. They loved God so much that they took something that, were, that was as valuable as books and destroyed them. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, when we look at information and the access that we have to it, guess what? It is a vehicle that our adversary, the devil, uses to get in our minds and influence us to pretend. Mm -hmm. Books can contain bad information. Mm -hmm. Songs can contain bad information. Mm -hmm. Websites, www.whatever-whatever bad information. Movies, television shows, bad information. And when we look at the things that permeate our society today, we see a consistent recurring of ungodly, ungodly things. We can't turn on the television anymore without seeing homosexuality being promoted, adultery being promoted, fornication being promoted, reckless living being promoted. Get a, a mentality that says I'm entitled to have whatever I want to have without working for it. The celebration of ignorance, arrogance, and discrimination. None of those things are of God. But if those messages are constantly being spoken out there over and over again, if we don't have his word in us, guess what's going to eventually happen? We will be swayed. We will become influenced. And guess what? We will start to pretend as if we have no relationship with God and perpetrate the behaviors that are, that, that are being spoken into our minds. Amen. That's why it is important for us today, brothers and sisters, to make the decision that if we're going to be with God, we are going to be for him 100%. Amen. If we're not going to be for him, then you, we put our souls in jeopardy when we make that decision. That's no middle ground. I know when we listen to things and, and, and participate in activities and have access to information, there are so many things that are socially acceptable that your social level of awareness may be called into question if you have a problem with that stuff. Well, you know what? That, we're not the ones with the problem. People who think that stuff is all right are the ones with the problem. People who believe that all of this, this, this immoral mess that, that the people who believe that all of this immoral mess increases their social stature, they are the ones with the problem. I think about David in the 51st Division of Psalm when he said, create in me a clean heart. When you look at the backdrop, the implication of the dirtiness that was in his heart, when you go back and you research that concept, about a dirty heart as it's, as it's approached in, in Psalm 51, it comes from the same word that we get sepsis or septic tank from. Mm -hmm. 
We know it's in that wow. stuff that smells bad. Yes, and so the, we, the question becomes, how do we, what type of aroma do we want associated with our names, associated with our lives? Do we want what we offer to smell sweet to God? Or do we want to indulge in things, amen? Do we want to swim around the septic tank and get out of it smelling just like it? That's the choice that we got to make. That's the challenge that's at hand. There are people who are smelling like stuff. Yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah, smelling like that, that stuff. Yes, yes. And wearing it as a badge of honor because they surround themselves by people that smell like stuff. But as a child of God, they can have all of that mess that they want to. As a child of God, I'm going to stay in a we need to stay in a position where we have access to ongoing cleansing and ongoing forgiveness so that we can have the aroma that God not only desires, but that he has set us apart to emit. Amen. He didn't send his son Jesus to die on the cross so we could smell like that stuff he washed away. He didn't send Jesus to die on the cross so that we can keep walking in, in, in mess, walking in shame. Amen, somebody. He didn't send Jesus to die on the cross so that we can have a spiritual odor that repulses people and push them away. Yeah. He sent Jesus to die on the cross so that our sins would be forgiven yes. and that we would emit the same aroma that is associated with his cleansing, his cleanliness, and his sanctification. Yeah. Early in Sunday school, Brother Matthews was talking about being sanctified. Being sanctified is a good thing. That means that I've been torn apart from the mess and I've been put in a place that's sacred and I'm earmarked to be used by God for his specific purpose. When God made us, when he recreated us according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he didn't recreate us in the image of mess. Instead, he recreated us into his image so that everything that we go, people would see him working in us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, and they would be able to smell the goodness from our lives. You know, some names have a bad stench on them. But church family, we who are Christians who've named the name of Christ, yes. we've decided that we don't want to be in that mess anymore. And we're going to stay in our role so that we can emit the same aroma, amen, somebody, yes. that we receive from our God up on high. These vices after they were destroyed. The Bible says in verse number 20, the word of the Lord grew mightily. The name of Jesus had been magnified and the word of the Lord grew mightily. There's just something uh, powerful about the name of Jesus. When we look at Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Paul said, Peter rather says, that if we want all of that stuff washed away, that we got to get baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of the removal of that sin. Sin is that stuff. What makes it possible for that stuff to get washed away? The name of Jesus does. The name of Jesus, there's power in it. In Acts chapter 3, verse number 6. The Bible says that there was a lame man laying on Solomon's porch. Yeah, well, the man couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. But when the apostle, when Peter reached out and raised, lifted him up, he said, in the name of Jesus you are healed. And the man stood up. Yeah. He not only walked, but he went inside the temple and was leaping. Yeah. Why was he leaping? Because his condition yeah. had been changed. Yeah. And church family, we got a reason to leap and rejoice yeah, today. Right. Yeah. Because that one time we had been crippled yes, by that old man. Stuff, but we came in contact with the Lord. He strengthened our legs and we're able to not only stand up, but we're able to walk and lead. Amen, somebody. There's power in the name of Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, wherefore God also has highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. And it doesn't stop there. Look at verse number.
number 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice that he's given him a name that is more powerful than every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, every means every. Whether you're a person who's poor, broke, busted, and disgusted, or somebody who's living in the ivory tower, regardless of where you are in your life, everybody will bow at the name of Jesus. And because of what he did on Calvary, we're able to have the connection to that power contained in his name and amen. Regardless of where we are on the socioeconomic spectrum, even for those of us who said yes to Christ, that power isn't gone. See, a lot of times we put so much emphasis on baptism that we give the impression that that after baptism the power leaves. Oh no, 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 no! As long as we stay with Him and continue to grow, Amen. Somebody, we become more and more empowered, Amen, as a chosen vessel for Him. It doesn't stop. Baptism, yes, that's a celebratory experience. Yes, it is the beginning of the new start. But all it is is a start. When we spend time with God and we have and we have experience and interaction with that power, that should reassure us that not only did we make a decision, but we have someone who's greater than all of this stuff and this mess that we have to live among. The Bible says... He gives us some directions in Colossians 3.17. He says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Yes, sir. In order to do all in the name of the Lord, that suggests that we've submitted to his authority. Mm -hmm. That means that we have decided to be united with him and added to his body. If Since we have submitted to his authority, that positions us such that we can do all in his name. That verse was written to and for Christians. But I'm going to give you another one that was written to and for Christians. That one, that good old Sunday school verse, that Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't just do and stop there. But the more that I do, the stronger that I become. I don't just stop at saying yes. I am a Christian and just park it right there. We keep on living. Why is that? Because the more we live for him, the more he empowers us, the stronger that we become. Amen. Now, is there anybody in here who can't use a little extra strength? Is there anybody who's watching us on Facebook Live who can't benefit from being strengthened by the Lord? Is there anyone here who has such a, a false view of themselves that you think you don't need a little help or a little pick-me-up sometime? Is there anyone who's so intelligent and so intellectually sound that you don't believe you need guidance to navigate 